To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, visit gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Chimpanzee poop. Lumps of dirt. Whale snot particles. Field scientists can collect thousands of samples for their research projects, each with their own important attributes that some poor lab assistant or grad student will need to categorize. And all that collecting and documenting can bleed into the world of software, too. Like databases and statistical software that let you test important questions, like whether killer whales have more snot than blue whales. Science is just so beautiful. But no matter what we're studying, the amount of information you have to keep track of can quickly get unwieldy. Google has potentially billions of users around the globe, and as a company, they keep track of unique data on each of those users. Think names, ages, email addresses, and so much more. In many cases, we don't just want to store all of this information. We want to do something with it, like perform the same calculation on every sample or sending every user the same update email. And we don't want our poor lab assistant to keel over on their keyboard. It's a nice keyboard. Whether you're dealing with whale snot or app users, an array list can come in super handy for these kinds of problems. I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, code and programming for beginners. There are lots of different data types in Java, which are different categories of information that a program can store or use. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, whale snot is not one of those data types. In this series so far, we've mostly talked about scalar data types that contain one value. They're also called primitive data types. Think of things like an integer, a character, or a Boolean value. An array list is a new data type that we can add to our toolbox. Array lists contain multiple elements instead of a single value, and we can think of them as collections of other data types. These collections aren't a chaotic Pinterest board either. Array lists are organized with an index, which is a reference system of numbers that correspond to each element in the list. And Java, like most programming languages, uses a system called zero indexing, so every index starts with zero instead of one. Array lists can be made of scalar data types, as well as non-scalar data types, that contain more than one value, like strings, or even other lists. The only restriction is that every element in one array list has to be the same type, so you can't mix your integers and strings in one big mess. Array lists are really powerful because they can store a lot of data in a compact, organized way, which drastically increases the size of the problem we can solve in a shorter amount of time. Work smarter, not harder, am I right? I'm back on the idiom train! So let's say we've flown the snot bot and gathered all of our field data. Now we're at the point in the research process where we're ready to analyze. Just like we had to define a new integer or string variable using specific Java syntax, we have to create a new array list before we can fill it up with data. Unlike creating a string or integer variable, we need to indicate what data type we're going to fill our array list with, and we do that inside of angle brackets. In this example, we're creating an array list of integers. Immediately after these angle brackets, we give the new array list a name, like the super creative my list. But in all seriousness, just like when we create new variables, we want to make sure that the name we give an array list is specific and noun-like to describe its contents. That way, we can save our future selves or teammates some headaches. So maybe when we clean up the code, we can change it to whale snot or something. Since we're creating an array list of integers, the name is followed by an equal sign, then new, then array list with integer in an angle brackets, then empty parentheses, and finally a semicolon, the cherry on top of any line of Java code. This syntax is the same for any kind of array list. You just need to swap out the data type in angle brackets to match what's going to be inside. Currently, our array list is empty, so we need to add some elements to it. To add the integer 10, we type my list, which is the name of the array list that we're filling, followed by dot add with the integer we're adding in parentheses. You might recognize this syntax from other episodes. We're using an add method here. We can repeat that line of code to add other integer values, such as 2 and negative 14. There are other methods that let us add more than one element at a time, but dot add will do the trick for now. After we've filled our list with elements, we may want to access them again later. To see them all at once, we can use a simple print statement. You can see all three elements we added in the order we added them. They have indexes 0, 1, and 2, respectively. We 
can also access specific elements by looking them up based on their index with the get method. Instead of putting the element in parentheses like we did with the add method, we use the index value that we want to check in our list. So, for example, we type in mylist.get1 to return whatever element is stored at index 1, which is the integer 2. If we want to know how many elements we've added to our list, or how big our array list is, we can use the command mylist.size, and it will count the elements in our list. The number of elements in our list will be one greater than the last valid index in our list, and that's thanks to how zero indexing is different from the way our brains, and this method, count. We can also remove elements from our list based on their index. If we want to remove the element at index 2, we can use mylist.remove2, and we can check that it happened by adding in a couple of little print statements to see that we initially had three elements, but after the remove method, only two elements are left. It can be a little tricky to remember what you're supposed to put in the parentheses for all of these commands, but it might help to know that ArrayList don't have a built-in function to search for a particular element or value within the list. We'll have to do that ourselves. So, we can add any value by putting the value in the parentheses, but we have to provide the index for methods like get and remove because we aren't able to search by the value to remove a specific one. So, if I wanted to know how much snot Horatio had, I can't search for Horatio, I search for three. And then we don't need to put anything in the parentheses for the size method because it applies to the whole list. Once we have an array list full of data, we can use other programming tools to do lots of different things with that information. Let's make a new array list to start fresh, a grocery list with six elements in it. As a reminder, these elements will have indexes of 0 through 5. And now, let's suppose we want to print every element in the list one by one instead of all at once. I like my grocery list nice and vertically spaced out. We can do that by setting up a for loop to iterate through each element in the list. As a quick for loop refresher, there are three key parts. We have our counter, or index initialization, which is an integer variable named i and set to start at index 0, because that's the first element of our list. Next, our condition says only loop over this code while i is less than grocery list dot size. We're using the size of our grocery list as the upper bound because we might want to add or remove elements from our list later, and grocery list dot size will change with our list. It if we used 5 as our upper bound, we would have to go back and change it if we altered our list. And third, we have a statement that increments our counter by 1 every time the loop runs, so we iterate through every single index number and don't skip any. In the curly brackets of the for loop, let's add the instruction to print every element. Every time the code in our loop runs, the value of i is used as the index, and the value of the index is returned by grocery list.get. Now we can check if we did everything right by running this code. The output we want is the list of strings, our grocery items, in the order that we added them to our array list. Array lists of scalar data types, like integers and strings, are definitely useful for completing small tasks, but they might not be complex enough to meet the needs of bigger problems. For example, if we wanted to program a contact list in Java for our whale researchers, because that's a thing that they need, to contact the whales, we need an array list of elements that have more than one value, at least a name and a tracking number and a phone number, who's giving these whales phones. We can create this kind of information packed list by making an array list that stores lots of instances of a class. Here's what you need to know for now. For this simple contact list, we'll create a contact class that has two strings as properties, name and phone number. Now my thing is like, where are they getting the phone plants? Right? Anyway, a a class can't exist without a special kind of method called a constructor method, which allows us to create new instances of our contact class and, in turn, add these pre-grouped elements we want to our array list. Then we go back to our program's main class, where we're able to create an array list like we've been all episode. Here the data type is the class contact, and because we're programmers who name things responsibly, we'll call it snotty whales. I'm just kidding. Contact list. Of course, we want to add data to our contact list, and we can still use the add method to do that, just with a comma to separate the two strings that make up the contact class properties. As we add each new contact, we'll also create a new instance of the contact class. And there you have it, a replacement Rolodex. Do I sound like an ad exec from the 60s targeting whales? 
I hope so. Hello, sharks. One of the superpowers of coding is the sheer amount of data that modern computers can hold and process, compared to like having to organize filing cabinets of important papers by hand. Once you have an array list set up, you can use other tools like for loops to perform a task on every element in our list with just a few lines of code. And the examples we coded in this episode are just the tip of the iceberg. Array lists are a key part of many Java programs, from whale snot and earwax sample analysis to storing usernames behind the scenes, and they can really take the scale of your programs to the next level. After all, without organizational tools like these to process the data, we wouldn't be able to make discoveries. We also wouldn't be able to call all of our whale friends! Who we have? Horatio? If you're enjoying Study Hall Code and Programming for Beginners and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Unless you're Horatio, then, like, we have that call on Tuesday, right?